Okay, thank you, and uh, welcome to the first Doherty hypothetical. So the format of this hypothetical is going to be a story that unfolds to the audience and to the panel, and we'll navigate the scenario and bounce different ideas off as the, the scenario progresses. And so really at any given point in the story, each panelist will uh, prosecute the various themes that are linked to their expertise. So the hypothetical will examine and prosecute uh, some unusual aspects of an outbreak um, that are kind of unlikely. They're quite provocative and they will challenge some ideas of normality, equality and family. So it is not intended in any way to be offensive or offend anyone, but instead to allow all of you to ponder and reflect on how you may indeed respond if such a scenario were to uh, unfold. So, without further ado, let me introduce to you the panel we have today. So, in no particular order, we have Irani uh, Thevarajan, infectious diseases physician from the Royal Melbourne Hospital and also the Doherty Institute. Maybe Irani puts a hand up. Uh, Dr. Catherine Gibney, epidemiologist and infectious diseases physician, also from the Doherty. Dr. Mike Catton, medical virologist and microbiologist at Vidral and Doherty Institute as well. Professor Kit Fairley, Director of Melbourne Sexual Health Clinic. Professor ben Brendan Murphy, Chief Medical Officer of Australia from Department of Health. Professor Julian Savalescu, bioethicist from Oxford University. And Professor Fabian McKay, immunologist from the Doherty. So welcome, and thank you very much for agreeing to be on the panel today. So, to begin our story, we have a two-day music festival which is held in country Victoria in idyllic surroundings with green fields, horses, cows, kangaroos, creeks and plenty of room for camping. It's a very well attended event. Jack and Jill are very excited. Their two young children are being minded by the grandparents this weekend and along with Jill's newly married brother Adam and husband Steve, they set up camp in the idyllic surroundings. In the course of the weekend, Jack and Jill go up the hill to fetch a pail of water. The water's clear, so they have no fear, but perhaps they really ought to. <laughs> That's it for the rhymes. <laughs> Four days later, at the Royal Melbourne Hospital Emergency Department, Jill comes in. She has fevers, severe headaches, altered conscious state, photophobic, and is admitted to the hospital. She has no recent travel history, overseas or local, other than the weekend that she's just attended. Jack, her husband, indicates that they did not take any drugs at the music festival. So Irani, as an infectious diseases physician, you see Jill on admission. What are your first thoughts at this stage and what happens in the normal course of the diagnostic algorithm? Okay, so it sounds that like she's presenting with a meningoencephalitic syndrome. Um, and I'm, I'm always a little bit concerned when I, when I get a call about a meningoencephalitic syndrome. They, these are uh, clinical situations that can generally deteriorate quite rapidly. So I really want to try and gather information fairly quickly on her exposures so that I'm um, well placed to know what are the first initial investigations and managements that I need to put into place. So it sounds a little bit like she doesn't have any exotic travel outside of the country. That's a relief. That sort of removes a few things off the differential list. And the differential list is fairly broad. Um, it sounds like she might have had some animal exposure in terms of where she was located. But, and she's in country Victoria and hasn't travelled too close to the New South Wales border or Western Australia border, Julian? No, no. no? Okay. So again, I'm really thinking about local things. And most of the time... And then... I'd like, I'd, I'd like to stand back a little bit and think, well, this could be infective, but I don't want to have my tunnel vision infectious diseases glass on. It could be non-infective. If it's infective, it could be viral, bacterial, fungal, parasitic. So I'm really looking at all the possibilities here. Um, and I, I want to really start to ask about what investigations can be done initially. So there'll be basic um, uh, investigations that I'd like to order to get a sense of what this person's background is, if there's any immune status problems, um, like full blood and liver functions, are there other organ involvement? Um, 
And then it's really looking more closely at what infections could be occurring. So I'd like to ask for some initial tests, such as blood cultures, urine cultures, a nose and throat swab. And the blood cultures are looking for bacteria? Yeah, yep. so essentially the blood cultures will be looking for bacteria. I'd be thinking about given that she's in an environment where common things happen commonly. So I do want to think about common viruses and common viruses that do cause an encephalitis-like presentation are usually things like enteroviruses and herpes viruses. It's flu season, so influenza is a possibility. So that all of those, what's likely is going to direct the initial <coughs> test. So, um, and uh, one of the key critical tests for a presentation like this is a lumbar puncture, um, as well as some brain imaging. So they will sort of be the, the, the first level of tests that um, I'd be interested in looking at. Okay, so Irani gets these samples and investigations done. The tests come back negative, by which time Jill's condition has worsened. She's unconscious and she's now admitted to the intensive care unit. Her CSF has 50 lymphocytes, her protein level is up, her blood cultures are negative, listeria is negative, TB is negative, herpes simplex and enterovirus are also negative. The MRI indicates that there are changes in the temporal lobe of the brain. So what would happen from here? Yeah. So um, she'd, she'd certainly be, uh, the, the CSF picture, which we usually tend to get fairly early on in a piece like this, is suggestive of a viral etiology. Um, I'd certainly be starting some empirical treatment on her, um, even before the lumbar puncture tests are there, to cover things that are, it's very important to try and cover patients for what is treatable and certainly some of the more concerning, so herpes simplex virus should be on a broad antiviral like IV acyclovir. I would have also started on some antibacterial um, cover like keftriaxone and penicillin to cover bacteria. Um, but looking at that CSF picture, I'm, I'm starting to get a, 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 a picture that this is a viral cause to her encephalitis. At this stage, I'd be wanting to know a little bit more, so I'd probably go back to the family, ask a little bit more about exposures. Was there a, um, a, a dog bite 15 years ago, for example? Could this be, could this be rabies with a l long incubation period? Did she have any exposure to bats? What exactly was the nature of her exposure to the animals that she was in the music festival? So you're really starting to look for um, what kind of exposure and what sort of tests, because the next call is going to be to my friendly folk at the pathology and laboratory because I'm going to want to discuss with them what tests I can do on that CSF sample and what the timing and likelihood I am of getting some of the results of these tests um, results are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Irani, uh, Mike, Irani contacts you as a medical virologist at Vidral to discuss the case and really asks what additional just routine uh, testing can be done in this instance for this uh, pa individual patient? Sure. So um, we've already, well, encephalitis is quite challenging um, from the lab um, side to diagnose because we've got a, a small group of very common viruses, herpes simplex notably that's treatable, <coughs> and enteroviruses, and then a very long list of other causes that are pretty uncommon. And it's, um, it's quite hard um, without epidemiology that, and Rani's been um, hinting at in history to, to kind of focus your lab strategy. So we've, we've already flagged things we're interested in like animal exposures, like travel, um, like other illnesses in the recent past that might guide the algorithm. So I, I, um, I don't think either of us have got a clear idea of what time of year we're talking about. I was assuming mm. the music festival might be in summertime. In we'll say it's summer. So yeah. I was thinking more along the lines of wanting to um, exclude flaviviruses, so notably Quinjin and Murray Valley and Kephalida. So that would be top of the list. We've got a, a broadly... So these are mosquito spread viruses? Yep. Yeah, and they're endemic in northern, Vic or not endemic in northern Victoria, but in the, in the Murray Valley region of Victoria, um, we can see infrequent outbreaks of those viruses. They're, they're permanently present further to the north and to the west um, than in Victoria. But, so that's an important diagnosis. They're quite nasty, untreatable, um, but at least we don't die wondering in terms of a diagnosis. Um, I'd also um, be interested in some other herpes viruses. None of them cause encephalitis commonly in immunocompetent adults. Um, and they're, they're not as treatable as herpes simplex, but there is some literature on um, Epstein-Barr virus, varicella zoster virus, human herpes virus 6 and 7, um, some case literature on use of antivirals in those um, 
viruses and so on. But some of those are picked up in our herpes virus multiplex PCR, a sort of a, a PCR that detects uh, a, a test for the nucleic acid genes of the virus that detects a number. So first off, I'd cover those viruses. Yep. Okay, so we test for all those, those additional things, and they also all come back negative. So with a single individual case, is there anything further that we do in terms of investigation, or is that kind the, of it? The cases you tend to get rung up about are younger than most. They've yeah. got, they were relatively well before they had this happen to them. They've got lots of years of good life ahead of them. You're wanting to do everything you can, particularly find a treatable infectious diagnosis, but if, but otherwise find an untreatable one that at least tells you you're not missing something else. So I, I think you have a low threshold for doing a lot of testing on someone like this. And usually the rate limiting steps, the amount of sample you've got, not cost or scientist time or anything like that. So I'd expand the list down um, to include respiratory viruses, even yeah. if it's not flu season. Flu's well described as a common virus and an, uh, an uncommon complication of a common virus can still um, happen relatively frequently. The flu, paraflu, um, and adenoviruses can cause encephalitis in adults, test for those. Um, beyond that, uh, look, I'd, I'd actually, although incredibly uncommon, I think, in this situation, I'd test for HIV because mm. um, acute HIV infection can present with encephalitis and it's treatable if you find it. So more because it's treatable than because we expect the diagnosis. So that's probably where I'd go next. Yeah. Okay. So Irani, back to you. Jack is by Jill's side in uh, the hospital. He now has headaches as well and he's had them for a couple of days and is feeling a lot worse. He indicates that he's just heard from Steve, his brother-in-law, over at the Alfred Hospital and he's just been admitted as well. Um, with a couple of other people that they know also that attended this festival also being admitted at the Alfred. Would this change how you look at the event and would the two treating teams at the hospital in any way communicate between each other and, and, and establish a link? Yeah, well that's very important information because that is now giving us an idea that this is a transmissible infection. There's a cluster potentially of patients that are being affected by the same illness. There's no automatic way of finding out what's happening in another tertiary hospital around Victoria. So I would pick up the phone and I would call the clinical unit um, that are looking after the patient and share our experience of what's happening here at the Royal Melbourne and try to find out what's actually happening with that patient across at the other hospital. Uh, that's a really, I think that's a very important, you know, that sort of communication within hospitals, whether it's on a clinical or laboratory level, um, that networking becomes really, really important in situations like this where you don't really know what's going on, our first gamut of tests are all negative. Um, we're dealing with a patient that's probably deteriorating, so we want, you know, time is, we're, it's time critical, um, and all of the information that we can all pull together uh, becomes really important. Yeah. So, Mike, mm -hmm. we now have a cluster. Irani lets you know of the Alfred uh, cases, and uh, all the previous tests were negative, as we know. What additional options have we got for a, a discovery of something novel or new that might be uh, established in these yeah. people? These are the situations in which the pulse quickens. You when you're on the end of the phone in the lab because you start to this is significant. Mm. This is what happened famously in 2007 when there was that cluster of transplant transmitted infections in Victoria. As the two clinical teams did exactly that. Um, at the Austin and the Royal Melbourne talked to one another and established that we had um, these linked people. Mm -hmm. And then the lab was brought into it and, and then a, a sort of event, series of events flowed from there. So look, I'd, um, I, I'd maybe finish off the list of the conventional tests. So there are things like even parvovirus B19, which is a, which is a rash illness of kids that uh, you wouldn't think got into the brain. There's a case literature for that causing encephalitis in the last 10 years. So quickly throw anything left on the differential list of viruses like that um, to have tested for. But then I think we're looking at a, a investigation of a, a something with public health significance, potentially something novel. Um, so we'd go to reference laboratory techniques. First we do viral culture. We don't have a lot of cell lines available on any given day these days, but we'd have at least a couple vero cells and health cells. Very, very low yield in, in encephalitis out of CSF, but urine, if we had some urine, we'd been having quite a bit of success 
first with lately. Um, so we'd, we'd put those specimens into culture to give us a broadly based chance to grow something um, that we weren't expecting. Because the molecular tests are often quite targeted to ask, is this virus present, yes or no? Which is a nice segue into the next thing that we do, which is um, to use, um, and, and in describing it to you, Julian, I'm telling you about a group of tests that you developed, but um, <laughs> this, is, this is some low stringency um, uh, nucleic acid tests that are designed not to look for a virus, yes or no, but to look for families of viruses. So like, um, and I'll rattle off some names, but they won't mean anything, like paramyxovirus, so measles virus and, and its relatives, or picornavirus, which is common cold virus and, and its relatives, um, toga viruses, which include the Ross River virus and its relatives. So there's a whole panel of those that we have for viral discovery which were developed after the transplant incident that I'm, I was talking about before. And those are designed to um, find the unexpected or the new. And there's a checkerboard in Julian's office of which panels we use and which clinical syndrome. So we'd be in Julian's office um, mapping out the strategy of which primer sets we'd be using. Um, we'd also, I think, start some next generation sequencing not, I think, with the expectation of a real-time diagnosis, because it takes some weeks, really, to do the various stages of that, and the yield out of um, CNS infections on real clinical specimens has been really, really low in the literature with that, but I think we'd give it a go in yep. this situation. But I think we'd pin most of our hopes on the, um, the redundant PCRs, and then hope to luck into actually recover. And what, what samples would you really target in, in a scenario like this? Yeah, well, I've, I've mentioned a couple. Obviously, um, the cerebrospinal fluid yep. from the brain, because that's where the virus is. And even if someone's shedding virus at other sites, the most significant place to find it is where it's causing infection. So you're interested in that, but often small volumes of sample, a lot of competition for other tests, used up maybe. So whatever CSF you could get. Certainly urine because we're finding um, an increasing number of viruses. Um, really, it was Zika that triggered uh, at looking as much as we have, but we've been finding viruses um, from a range of syndromes in the urine more than we expected. So it's easy to get people produce large volumes of it, so you can get quite a lot. You can concentrate it and do testing on that. So we try and get some urine. We get some whole blood, both so we could get some white cells with a view to maybe immunological studies um, down the track if we found anything. Um, and to nucleic acid tests on the blood itself. Great. Okay. So the additional samples are, are sent and tested, as it happens in my lab. Um, and uh, they're put up for the uh, consensus PCR, which are these PCRs that are very detuned and very non-target specific. And the sequence is amplified, and when it is sequenced, it identifies or has a closest match to a Borna virus um, of horses. So this is a negative sense single-stranded RNA virus. The transmission routes in horses are generally fomite, direct uh, contact, urine, feces, or saliva. So more of an enteric uh, route of transmission. The virus is also associated with neurological changes and also possible behavioral changes. So Mike, what happens next in terms of some of the research questions? Uh, and sample types collected during for duration of shedding exercises or investigation or, or what have you. Look first, I go what the, <laughs> 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 and and rush to rush to look up Borna viruses on Google. I think, um, <laughs> <laughs> but but right after that. So sorry, the question was about sample collection. Yeah, so well, we've really sort like of covered. Our, 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 <laughs> after the initial shock, and uh, and really the what the moment. Um, yeah, what what do we do? Okay, look, well, uh, I've talked about samples we collect. Yep. I didn't mention the oropharynx or, or feces, but, but we'd be really interested. I mean, we've got a diagnosis in one patient. I, I think we've got other clinical patients that we've got access to, so um, certainly we'd be willing to try and pin the diagnosis down for everybody that we think are linked and be looking at the sequence to see if that, and show that it's related, so confirm we've really got a cluster. Yep. Um, I'd be interested in knowing... Um, how long it's shared and where from. So when we're thinking about what we're telling doctors and nurses in the hospital caring for these people or what we're ultimately going to tell the community when we get to that point, we need to know well, what are the risks. And, yeah. um, so we'd be wanting to follow the patients at multiple sites. 
I'd be interested in the genotype, so the sequence of the virus. Um, so I think you've already mentioned a horse one. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> because there's some controversy yep. in relation to that, which we won't get into. Um, I'd be wanting to try a wider range of cell lines. The couple that we happen to have in the lab on any given yep. day, uh, I'm presuming we haven't grown it yet, but uh, uh, re you really want to recover the virus when it's a funny virus, so we've got it to um, develop tests with or do research with later or whatever. So give it a red hot go to recover the virus yep. any way we can. Um, I'm thinking antibody tests because we've got, you can develop nucleic acid tests pretty quickly these days using software off the viral sequence. At the moment we just got. have this short little segment. Yeah, okay, well we'd but, make some uh, specific primers to that and yep. we'd order those and you can get those made for you very, very rapidly. And then we'd be using the specimens that we've got from this cluster of patients to start a validation dossier of the test yep. with an eye to the regulator later showing that we can do a good quality test. Um, and I guess... Yeah, look, that'll do. That's fine.